In this era of globalization, considering the growing use of Ayush drugs, a nationwide program has been initiated under the central sector scheme funded by the Ministry of Ayush, New Delhi, for monitoring and developing a system-wise database of adverse drug reactions related with Ayush drugs. <laughs> Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College, being selected as one of the peripheral pharmacovigilance centers in homeopathy, this awareness program being hosted is aimed at providing an insight into observing, reporting, and documenting the adverse drug reactions related with homeopathic medicines. Prayer is the recognition of our limitation and our dependence on the Almighty. Let's invoke the blessings of the Almighty through a silent prayer. I now request our principal, Dr. ESJ Prabhukiran, to deliver the welcome address. Good afternoon to you all. I'm happy to welcome each one of you to this online awareness program on pharmacovigilance in homeopathy, hosted by Peripheral Pharmacovigilance Center of Father Muller's Homeopathic Medical College. It's my privilege to welcome our administrator, Reverend Father Roshan Krasta to this program. He represents the management which promotes homeopathic medical education, quality patient care through homeopathy and promotes advanced research as well. I welcome you, dear father. I welcome Dr. Swapan Pal Coordinator, Intermediary Pharmacovigilance Center, National Institute of Homeopathy, Kolkata, for the, who is also the resource persons or person of our session one on introduction to pharmacovigilance in homeopathy. Sir has been guiding, with, uh, guiding us regularly in our activities, has also been motivating us to take up the pharmacovigilance activities in the way they should be done. Well, I thank you, sir, for your help to the institution. I, and I wholeheartedly welcome you to this program. I welcome Dr. Shashikant Tiwari, former principal, Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College, and former director of National Institute of Homeopathy, Kolkata and eminent practitioner in Dakshin Karnataka district of Karnataka. Sir is also a resource person for the adverse drug reactions and adverse drug events from homeopathic perspective. Dr. Shashikant Tiwari will definitely add the practitioner's perspective and the practical utility of the concept of pharmacovigilance. I welcome Dr. Vivek Shakti Dharan, Associate Professor, Department of Homeopathic Pharmacy at Father Muller's Homeopathic Medical College. Dr. Vivek also is Coordinator of, Pharma, of Peripheral Pharmacovigilance Center at Father Muller's HMC. Dr. Vivek is also actively involved as Institutional Ethics Committee member at Father Muller Charitable Institutions, Father Muller Research Center. He has taken a lot of pains to organize a series of activities over the years. I heartily welcome you, dear Vivek. I welcome Dr. Gino Jose, Assistant Professor, Department of Homeopathic Pharmacy at Father Muller's Homeopathic Medical College, who will speak on Drugs and Magic Remedies Act 1954, its importance to pharmacovigilance. I heartily welcome all the resource persons to this program. I also welcome our Vice Principal, Medical Superintendent, members of the management committee, members of the faculty of Father Muller's Homeopathic Medical College. I heartily welcome all the participants, all the participants of this webinar from different parts of the country 
students of various homeopathic medical colleges, interns, postgraduate students, and importantly, practitioners who have taken time to attend this program. I believe the webinar, the online program, awareness program will be informative and it will be useful in promoting the concept of pharmacovigilance in homeopathy. Once again, uh, I welcome each one of you, including Dr. Meban, our MC, and special welcome to Dr. Fatima Saudat, a program assistant at Father Muller's Homeopathic Medical College Peripheral Pharmacovigilance Center. Uh, welcome to Dr. Fatima Saudat. And once again, I conclude my welcome speech by welcoming each one of you. And also, I thank each one of you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. For today's awareness program on pharmacovigilance in homeopathy, we have with us our first resource person, Dr. Chopin Pal. Going back to 2011 to 2014, Dr. Chopin Pal worked as a homeopathic medical officer in the government of West Bengal. Sir has worked as a lecturer and reader from the year 2004 in the Department of Homeopathic Materia Medica, Jawaharlal Nehru Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, Vadodara. Dr. Chopin Pal is presently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Materia Medica, NIH, and is also currently the Nodal Officer Intermediary Pharmacovigilance Center, NIH, Kolkata. He is the assistant editor of Journal of Homeopathy, published by NIH, also a PhD scholar, and is engaged in various research work. Sir has presented in national seminars, webinars, CMEs, and has a number of publications in various reputed and peer-reviewed journals and has a teaching experience of 15 years. Sir will now preside over the program with his topic, Introduction to Pharmacovigilance in Homeopathy. Delegates could post your queries in the chat box, which will be clarified at the end of the session. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon to all the participants, respected principal sir, and administrator sir, uh, Dr. Shakti Haran of Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College, other dignitaries, and the participants present in this webinar. So I heartily welcome you on behalf of Intermediary Pharmacovigilance Center, National Institute of Homeopathy, Kolkata, for this webinar session. So through this session, we'll be knowing different aspects of pharmacovigilance uh, program that is going on in Irish system, as well as particularly in homeopathy. So I'll be going through some introductory part uh, about the pharmacovigilance initiative uh, under Ministry of Irish uh, in connection to homeopathy. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, we know the global history. Uh, there are a lot many histories that are there, of which uh, the history I'm showing is the most important one. Uh, that uh, in 1961, Dr. McBride, uh, that an Australian doctor, who wrote a letter uh, to the editor of Lancet that uh, after using halidomide, uh, one of the medicine that is being, was being used during pregnancy. Uh, for uh, some uh, gastric discomfort. So some uh, uh, child was born with a congenital anomaly that was known as phocomelia. And that was an alarming incident uh, of using uh, some of this uh, thalidomide medicine and to which it attracted the global uh, attention regarding the pharmacovigilance uh, and what the what cause of developing this phocomelia in those uh, mother. Uh, and it was been identified that thalidomide medicine was the uh, was a medicine to, uh, for which this kind of congenital anomaly had developed. So through that uh, incidence, some of the European uh, uh, legislation was being uh, developed in 1965, followed by 1966, a pilot study was being done. Uh, in 1968, WHO program for international drug monitoring was instituted uh, after that after the incident. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 
So actually, Pharmaco is in the definition nicely given by WHO, and they have clearly defined that Pharmaco business science of collecting, monitoring, researching, assessing, and uh, uh, and the patients uh, on the adverse effect of medications, biological products, blood products, herbal vaccines, medical devices, traditional, and uh, some other complementary means. So WHO. Mentions that uh, it is not that only the medications are responsible for this adverse reaction, but some uh, biological products, some blood products, which used as a therapeutic purpose, that is also being uh, responsible for uh, this uh, adverse drug reaction. As well, they have included complementary medicines uh, through which that homeopathic system of medicine is being directly included under this pharmacological concept. Next one. That was the definition uh, by WHO. Uh, it has been it has been covered uh, many aspects, not only for medications but also the biological products, blood products which have been used as a therapeutic purpose, and some kind of vaccines uh, which are being uh, used and out of which some adverse reaction is happening. Uh, that has been included under pharmacovigilance concept as well as the traditional medicine or these complementary uh, uh, medications has also been included and our homeopathic system is also included in this pharmacovigilance initiative. Next. Next slide, please. Sir. So this, this is the uh, uh, these, these medications, herbal products, biological products, medical devices, blood products, vaccines, these are all included in this uh, okay, sir. Uh, next, 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 next slide, sir. Okay, so WHO says that uh, no medicine is without adverse consequences, although this vary in different, uh, uh, is varies in 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 uh, in its intensity. So uh, WHO, no degree of care and the caution that has been taken. Uh, during this preclinical stage of any medications. So that doesn't guarantee that a drug, uh, when it is being marketized or prescribed to the large population across the country. So according to WHO, that uh, no medicine is without any adverse consequences as well as for our homeopathic medicine also. So objectives of pharmacovigilance under Ayurveda, Shedda, Unani and homeopathic drugs. So the main objectives are to monitor the adverse drug reactions. So that is one of the part of our pharmacovigilance initiative to monitor the benefit risk profile of the medicines because we are gathering some information relating to this adverse drug reaction. So through which a benefit or risk benefit uh, profile can be drawn for a particular medicine to create the awareness amongst the healthcare professionals about the importance of ADR reporting that can be done to establish a database of adverse drug reaction, whatever the information we are collecting against a particular drug in, in terms of ADR or AD that can be uh, uh, that can be uh, accumulated in a database uh, for future uh, reference to evolve the evidence-based recommendation towards the clinical safety of Ayurveda Shida Unani drug and to communicate whatever the findings we are gathering through this initiative that can be communicated to the other stakeholders like drug manufacturers or the physicians or the practitioners to do the surveillance of the objectionable and misleading advertising. That is another part of pharmacovigilance initiative, it is not only that ADR or AD, but the misleading advertisement, we are also trying to find it out uh, so that we can we can stop some misconception and misinformation uh, through uh, which has been passed through this misleading advertisement. Next one. So what is the need of pharmacovigilance in our homeopathy? So misconception about the homeopathic drugs we have, uh, adulteration and contamination of Ayurveda, Yushita, Unani drug, then increased incidence of objectionable advertisements, lack of safety profile of the drug, malpractices, that is OTC drug that is going on, uh, and globalization of IO system. Next one. So this is misconception about homeopathic drugs. So homeopathy have no side effect because this is a usual, uh, usual thought is being passed for many years that homeopathy drug has no side effect and it is nothing but a passive effect and it can be consumed for the long time. It is not happening because in our practice and in our, uh, in our uh, this experimentation, we have also seen that homeopathy drug has some effect. So if it is being taken for a long time, so some kind of this uh, side effect and some kind of adverse event may happen uh, out of this long use of this homeopathy medicine. Next. So adulteration and contamination is being drunk in different ways. So adulterated drug, misbranded drug, 
uh, and the spirituals drug, which is uh, this not genuine drugs, when it is being used, some kind of adversity or adverse event may happen out of this uh, out of this uh, use of these medicines. Next one. So increase incidence of objectionable advertisement. So nowadays we are getting many kind of advertisement in our paper, in our media, and uh, in social medias. So misleading advertisement gives the wrong information to the community. And through this misinformation, uh, when the patient is or a person is consuming drugs, that can do a kind of adverse reaction or adverse events in this person. So it is, it is not advisable uh, that uh, looking to the uh, uh, advertisement, which is passing on uh, various wrong information, that should be practiced. So uh, uh, this pharmacovigilance initiative they controls about and they take initiative and they take some uh, actions uh, regarding this misleading advertisement also. Next one. So lack of safety profile of the drug because we are using a uh, lot many medicines in our clinics but we are not that much aware about our safety profile of the medicine that means what can be done by the long use of a particular mother tincture or a particular use of this potencies. So this kind of information we are not having right now. Because through this in uh, this pharmacovigilance initiative, if any kind of adverse reaction is happening or any kind of adverse event is happening out of the long use of any medicines, so that can be uh, collected and communicated to the uh, to the stakeholders also for the benefit of this medicine. Next, so in, uh, over the counter drugs, these are uh, sort of malpractices are there that over the counter drugs, some prescription is being taken to the uh, counter or uh, somebody is going to the counter and uh, the patient is asking for the medicines they are taking the medicine then uh, it is it is somewhat uh, difficult to, to uh, that, uh, that after taking that medicine some kind of adverse rea reaction or adverse event may happen out of this use of this medicine then misuse uh, or uh, misuse of prescriptions so some kind of prescription is uh, uh, is being misused like uh, some prescription has happened and uh, uh, some somebody uh, has a uh, concept that okay uh, for the headache somebody had taken belladonna so i am also having headache so some kind of uh, uh, this belladonna can be taken and it it will be a beneficial for me so this sort of misuse of this prescription should be stopped and uh, through this misuse of prescription some kind of adverse event may happen to the patient self medication that is going on nowadays because the social media as well as some uh, That can lead to some kind of adverse reaction or adverse event. Next one, please, sir. So this is a sort of globalization of the IOS system that we are going. Uh, we are going to do it. Uh, globalization of the IOS system because through this uh, initiative, if you can gather uh, some kind of informations uh, regarding the adverse reaction or adverse event, so globalization that is global acceptance and uh, some kind of information can be passed. Uh, to the society that uh, what kind of uh, information we have and what precaution we have to take before using any kind of medicines. Next one. So this is that uh, what doctor's consultation uh, should be done and over the counter drug uh, practice that should be stopped. Next one. Sir. So objectives of pharmacovigilance in homeopathy. So uh, through, this, uh, through this initiative, we are just trying to collect uh, some short of information relating to AD or ADR uh, uh, that, that uh, to establish a database uh, for the safety to uh, make a safety profile of the uh, drug and we are uh, we can update our Mitra Medica uh, through homeopathy pathogenetic trial uh, and, and, and doing some uh, likelihood ratio after getting this ADR of a particular medicine so some kind of uh, information uh, that can be used for HPT and LR. Uh, then providing documented evidence to the community that homeopathy can produce some kind of drug uh, actions. Uh, safeguarding the image of the homeopathy by preventing the misleading advertisement because through this misleading advertisement, some misinformation is being passed uh, uh, to the community that can be stopped. Then updating the information regarding the relationship of the drugs and increasing the credibility of homeopathy among the scientific community. Next one, please. So this is the network uh, which is uh, functioning under homeopathy uh, in pharmacovigilance. Uh, we, we have National Pharmacovigilance Coordination Center that is in 
New Delhi, uh, All India Institute of Ayurveda, uh, that is designated as MPVC, and under which we are uh, we are functioning our uh, centers. And on the top, we are having uh, that uh, that uh, Ministry of Ayush under which uh, we this initiative is being uh, is being carried out. So under National Pharmacovigilance Coordination Center, Intermediate Pharmacovigilance Center in Homeopathy, it is there. That is the National Institute of Homeopathy. And uh, um, uh, under this uh, intermediary pharmacovigilance center, uh, as of now, we have 16 peripheral centers all over India uh, through which this pharmacovigilance initiative is being carried out. Next. Slide. So, uh, regarding this reporting, what to report? So, all suspected drug related adverse events and the misleading advertisement that can be reported in a prescribed pro forma. That is, uh, this pro forma is there with our system. Then uh, who can report any healthcare professions? Uh, they can report any kind of adverse reactions to the concerned PPVC, that means nearby peripheral pharmacovigilance center or intermediate pharmacovigilance center. Where to report so that uh, information can be submitted to the PPVC or IPVC? We have our designated website for this pharmacovigilance initiative that is known as www.ilshuraksha.com. Next one. So what happens to the submitted report? Because whatever the information is being collected from any medical persons that has been handled very confidentially and very carefully, and the all information uh, is being noted and further verification is being done from the concerned persons or the concerned authorities uh, for any kind of clarification. And then the information is being noted and taken into consideration. And after that, uh, collecting all the information being sent to the next higher level, that is national uh, National Pharmacovigilance Coordination Center. Next one. So this is uh, uh, this uh, reporting uh, where it can be done. Uh, uh, our uh, this email ID is being given of National Institute of Homeopathy, that is ipvc.nis.kolkata, or it can be done uh, through direct reporting, that is www.isrusha.com. Next one. So we have some kind of reporting backdrop, right? So. Uh, actually, uh, actually, the major weakness that uh, spontaneous reporting is 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 the ma uh, main part of our pharmacovigilance initiative. All the doctors, all the uh, participants, and all the practitioners, those who are having, uh, if if they if they find out any kind of adverse reaction or any kind of misleading advertisement, that that can be reported. But our busy practitioners, they sometimes not getting uh, so much of time because they are very uh, very busy practitioners. So that is an uh, that is a uh, problem for us that we cannot, uh, uh, we can, uh, we, we are having some kind of uh, this reporting backdrop. So all the information is not coming, uh, coming to us. And uh, even then, uh, our request will be that uh, from your busy schedule, just take out time. If any kind of uh, ADR, ADE or misleading advertisement you are noticing, so it can be reported to the uh, centers. Next one. So these are the challenges we are having. Some healthcare professionals, they are very, uh, very busy. Self-medications uh, self or OTC drug uh, that remains unnoticed to the centers. Web-based medications, some people are taking some uh, counterfeit drugs, confounding illness, clinical trial monitoring, or some kind of administrative process that they are, uh, that can be a, uh, a problem for us. Next one. So need of pharmacovigilance awareness program. So same kind of uh, awareness program is going on. So what is the need of this pharmacovigilance awareness program? So awareness plays a key role in approaching, uh, improving the access to the health care system. Uh, so we seek to empower the communities and the patients. So we are, uh, we, we intend to award medical professionals with appropriate tools, information and skills so that they can make high quality information decision and prevent treatment, care and support. And we need to award the stakeholders like drug manufacturing unit or the individual researchers about the various dimensions of the pharmacovigilance initiative. So through this awareness program that can be done. So what the beneficiary is ultimately with this awareness program. So all paramedical, medical staff, other stakeholders, patient, community at large, and all medical professionals, they are the beneficiaries to this awareness program. Next. Next. So IPBC NIH Kolkata, it is under Ministry of Ayush, Intermediate Pharmacovigilance Center. The center is functioning since uh, 2018. Now, as on date, we are having 16 peripheral pharmacovigilance center for this initiative. Next. Slide. So these are the list uh, of
corruption in all over India. Next one. Uh, next one. These are all list actually we are having. Okay, so 16 uh, peripheral centers are there. Next one, please. So these are uh, the ADR or the ADE uh, reporting uh, uh, form that is maintained in our uh, this system uh, that is being uh, that is been there uh, in our website also. Next one. So this is the um, uh, this uh, uh, calculation that is Naranjo criteria through which the ADR or ADE that can be uh, that is being reported as of as on date now. Next one. So this is a format which is maintained for misleading advertisement. Next one. So this is the designated website that we are talking of, that www.ishuraksha.com. Uh, this this uh, website is there, and through which some uh, this uh, ADRAD or this uh, misleading advertisement can be reported. So followed uh, uh, these uh, these uh, slides will be going all the information that is being there in this website next so we'll be going very fast so this is uh through which next one please so this is the format which is there actually i'm just showing you uh, how it looks in the website so just next please so this information which are there we have to fill it up and then uh, it, in, it will be submitted so these are all relating to suspected adr uh, adverse radiation next one so next one please. so these are all format which are there in this website so okay so next one please yeah. so this is uh, the uh, website uh, uh, slide that is showing that uh, uh, these these uh, documents are there that is format is there in pdf and doc, uh, doc file so that can be downloaded and you can fill it up and then you can submit it to the uh, you can upload it uh, through this website next one so this is uh, the uh, uh, this misleading advertisement so through this website that can be reported next one so this is what uh, the format is in this website next one next so this is uh, this uh, doc file and the PDF file is there that can be downloaded and can be reported. This is uh, the homeopathic practice should be under strict uh, vigilance. So this is the need of the time. Uh, it helps to improve the system by adopting the set more scientific and up to date information. Uh, that that uh, information we are uh, getting in our uh, centers. It is an absolute necessary to ensure the public safety and to promote the healthy development of the homeopathic system of medicine. All the stakeholders of the homeopathic system of medicine need to be educated through the intensive training uh, regarding this pharmacovigilance aspect so that the initiative of this pharmacovigilance can be a fruitful one. And then pharmacovigilance initiative will facil uh, facilitate the detection of potentially unsafe drugs uh, and uh, misleading advertisement for taking any kind of regulatory actions by the higher authorities. So thank you so much for next. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, being connected with this webinar and uh, uh, for giving me. Uh, I'm 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 uh, very much thankful to the organizers and the uh, Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College Principal Administrator for giving me uh, this uh, opportunity to share this uh, introductory part about the pharmacovigilance Business Initiative. Uh, so um, thank you all. Thank you for. Uh, being connected with this webinar. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, sir, for your valuable information. As for the, um, sir, there is, there are some queries from the delegates in the chat box, sir. So the question is still now, any mm. other? Registered for homeopathic drugs. Uh, so the question is: Do you know any ADE or ADR are registered for homeopathic drugs? Hello. Uh, so the question is: Am I audible, sir? Hmm. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so the question is: Till now, any ADE or ADR are registered for homeopathic drugs? Uh, 
yeah actually till now whatever the informations we are getting uh, uh, establishing uh, this information as adr is now very difficult because that uh, criteria which is there for adr is not matching with our homeopathic uh, this uh, uh, these reactions which are getting from different centers so we are just considering right now as uh, as it is an ade adverse drug event not as adr so actually we had a discussion with the uh, ministry of ayush indicated officials that uh, adr is very difficult for homeopathic medicines we are not getting especially about this potency so just we are going by the name of ade right now because this is the generalized concept the generalized format which is being maintained for ayush system that is all ayurveda shita yunani and homeopathic drugs so for homeopathy we are just trying to find out some other ways of reporting this adr or ad uh, till now it has not been developed but we are in the process but uh, from the format which is the, uh, is being maintained right now uh, we are just considering all the information which has been collected as an ade uh, sir what about the combinations and formulations that are available in the market so combination medicine is not coming under purview of homeopathy because we are not, uh, these are not considered to be as homeopathic medicine even then any kind of this uh, misleading advertisement which is being passed through this combination of medicines in different ways we are tracking uh, taking the uh, tracking of this uh, information so we are uh, uh, we are the respective uh, the state uh, drug licensing authority is being intimated regarding this misleading information is being passed through this uh potent uh, these combination medicines and some kind of actions or regulatory actions being taken up uh, by a different state drug licensing authority okay thank you so much sir for your expertise thank you sir so there's another question then why is combination medicines given license yes the question is uh, mm. sir you are told no sir uh, the combination medicines are not considered as homeopathic the question yeah. is then why is combination med medicines given a license for manufacture uh, yeah uh, definitely actually this point has been rightly raised in the uh, this uh, our uh, ministry of ayush also because uh, how it is uh, being given why the permission is being given by the uh, by the uh, state drug licensing authority uh because actually this there are lot many in uh, problems are there because uh, some state uh, policies are there uh, that that st those state policies uh, individual state having their own policies so that that is now as on date this policies taking together in a similar way it is now being very difficult so that's why this combination are going on and that is being done as per the state licensing authority because ministry of ayush is not giving any kind of permission to the uh, to them because it is a, a concern of the state licensing authority only. and we are reporting all those informations to the state licensing authority this is our our uh, part that we are just reporting but we are not the authority to stop any uh, any this state licensing authorities uh, rules and regulations Okay, sir. Thank you so much for your <clears throat> your expertise. We now have with us our next resource person, Dr. Shashikant Tiwari. Dr. Shashikant Tiwari was the former principal, Padmala Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, former director, National Institute of Homeopathy, Kolkata, Government of India. He was the former dean of education. of dr nielsen homeopathic medical education and research winning pack canada he was the former chairman pg board of studies rajiv gandhi university of health sciences presently he is a chairman drug proving committee central council for research in homeopathy government of india he is also the guide and examiner for phd homeopathy university jaipur rajasthan So I have had experiences of being an expert lecturer for PG students and teachers at various homeopathic medical colleges. So as a life member of various associations like the Liga Medicorum Homeopathica Internationalis, Homeopathic Medical Association of India, 
Indian Institute of Homeopathic Physician, IHMA, Asian Homeopathic Medical League, and South Canara Homeopathic Medical Association. Serves also a faculty for repertory of PG program in veterinary homeopathy, Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, Kerala. Sir has received various auspicious awards, namely Award of Excellence received in 2005, the Homeo Ratna Award in 2018, Award of Excellence in 2019, the Best Homeopathic Teacher Award in 2019, and the latest award received was the Rajyot Sava Award in Medicine in 2021 by the Government of Karnataka. Sir's contribution has published a wide variety of books, including his famous Essentials of Repertorization, which was approved as textbook by Central Council Homeopathy, Government of India. He was the author of several other books, namely Homeopathy and Child Care and Father Muller's Manual of Homeopathy. Sir has also documented his video lectures on repertories module one to six. Sir is also the co-author of Menopausal Syndrome, Diabetes Mellitus, Handbook on Homeopathy and Case Taking to Prescribing, which was published by CCRH. So I will now be sharing his presentation on adverse drug reactions and adverse drug effects from homeopathic perspective. Over to you, sir. Can you listen to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Sir. And you can see also the slides. Uh, sir, but not the slideshow, sir. Now, can you see? Hello? Sir, it's not shared, sir.
is it okay hello uh, yes sir we can see okay the that the slide show the slide show sir if possible Now it's okay. Uh, no, sir. It has. It is still the same. Slide show is not coming. No, it's coming, sir. But uh, not the slide show. Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm just trying. I don't know. This can be seen, huh? Not visible. All slides are visible. Yeah, we can go there. Okay. All right, all right, we'll do. Uh, <clears throat> okay, my dear friends, uh, there was some technical error, and uh, I am not a very expert in that presenting of technical problems. I take some time. So kind of bear with me with the slides. Uh, it's mainly I have to talk uh, of experience of adverse reactions and adverse uh, drug control events. <clears throat> so uh, first, let me thank the organizers for organizing such a very vibrant session and very informative session. And uh, I must express that these things are required. The pharmacovigilance was not there in homeopathy, and it's still there are many people, many stalwarts who consider that pharmacovigilance is not possible. But if homeopathy is a science and it has some action, then it must be having overreaction, less reaction, harmful actions, good actions, because actions can be different. Otherwise, people will consider this placebo. And uh, many of the places, it has been real controversy that homeopathy is a medicine or controversy, I mean, uh, placebo. So in this view, uh, pharmacovigilance is really required. And this is possible through clinicians and academicians. The adverse drug reaction is mostly experienced or faced or witnessed by the clinician. And academicians has to guide those clinicians to accumulate, to document such data 
where the drug actions have gone beyond our expectations or against our expectations. So with this view, I will try to see uh, how we can do that and how it should be done. Because when we say homeopathy is a science, it's a system of medicine, system of treatment, and it has thousands of medicine, then we have to also think that some medicine will have some kind of adverse reaction in some people and we have to document it. So uh, to know all those things, uh, we'll go by slides and then see how we can really come to a conclusion. So first, let me see the adverse drug reaction, what it is, as it was defined by Swapan Paul also. Just revision. Adverse drug reaction can be defined as appreciably harmful or unpleasant reaction resulting from an intervention related to the use of medicinal product. Adverse effect usually predict hazards from future administration and warrant prevention or specific treatment or alteration of the doses, regimen, withdrawal of the product. So here purpose also is defined. If we know the adverse reaction, we can either uh, prevent that, warn that, or it can be uh, taken as some difference in the treatment, like improving of doses, stopping the medicine, changing the diet, or stopping uh, the treatment. Then another thing which comes is uh, in this only, there are two kinds of things. Either it can be because of the medicine we have prescribed, some mistake like overdosing, less dosing, or the way it should be prescribed, it is not done. Our second type of reaction may be because of the individual. Some of the individuals are oversensitive, like idiosyncratic individual. Whatever you give, it proves, like even Kent has observed that. So those kind of things we have to define because if one person is having bad reaction, that is not applicable to all the people, unless we verify in many people. And adverse drug event is, that what Sapan Paul was telling that at present we are at this level only, that any injuries resulting from medication use, including physical harm, mental harm, are loss of function. And adverse drug events compared with the medication error are more direct measures of patient harm. And these two things comes under pharmacovigilance. So pharmacovigilance is something very useful and it can improve the system as a whole. What it is, it is a science and activities related to the detection assessment, understanding, and prevention of adverse event or any other drug-related problem. So this is a body which observes, and after that, it collects and make a document, and it should be given to all the stakeholders, like even the college teachers, even the materia medica, or pharmacy, and the clinicians who are at the base to receive such kind of patients and reactions. So we have to understand first how homeopathy is different from pharmacovigilance in Ayurveda and pharmacovigilance in other system of medicine like allopathy. Because when some people say that it is not possible in homeopathy, they must be having some reason. And the reason being is our system is totally different. And let us see what difference it is so that we can improve our perspective of pharmacovigilance in homeopathy system of medicine. So first thing is homeopathy medicines are proved on healthy human beings. And in due course, homeopathic medicines were proved in potency, mainly 30 potency. So when medicines are prepared at this level, when uh, the chemical and physical and toxicological functions are just removed and only the dynamic actions are there, then the effect 
the side effects becomes minimum and then we have to study whether it is really doing any harm or it's only over sensitivity because of minimum quantity or no quantity of medicine being in the medicine it's a different from other system of medicine also there are no material doses administered for the study of medicine see when we study medicine by drug proven as i was telling mainly 30 now earlier uh, mother tinctures were proved in the beginning so they were harmful and there people uh, used to be a little uh, damaged also by proven like if we know that uh, dr herring who proved lachesis he could not use his tie for the whole life because the sensitivity was affected and further lachesis use was a little difficult so now because homeopathic medicines are proved only in potency the damaging effects are not uh, known much only the symptoms are noted down in the study of medicine and hence a pathogenesis of the symptomatology not much known and it is difficult also like when we study in materia medica uh, like a sensation of something crawling on the skin now what pathology may be there is only a symptom only a feeling and our our medicines have very strange symptoms sometimes where pathogenesis is very difficult to know but don't think that pathogenesis does not exist it exists but homeopathy is such a advanced science that it's slowly we are coming to know its action and bad effect afterwards in this context i will tell you dr kunjili who has written a kent repertorium generally he said that i wish i can live for more than 200 years because the study of homeopathy is such a vast that 100 years are not enough so i am just telling the vastness of homeopathy which uh, includes the physiology and pathology our pathology and physiology is not that advanced which can clearly define all the actions of corporatized medicine so this is one limitation in pharmacom pharmacovigilance in next is medicines are prescribed on the basis of similarity and that is what totality of patient should match with the totality of medicine exact similarity if it is there that only acts and one limitation i will tell you is the potency and doses is not well defined in our materia medica study see when we teach materia medica when we study materia medica one uh, very unfortunate thing is we study all the things and when the relation comes we don't study students also have seen they study up to aggravation amelioration that's all after that when relation comes they don't study now relation is very important for the prescription knowing the side effect knowing the antidote knowing the complementary this is very important for for which is not being emphasized unfortunately in our academic institution which has to be done so like uh, boric boric has some this kind of potency should be given but no other materia medica so once you have uh, taken a case you have repertorized find out a medicine you are at a loss what to do with that you have found out kali car is uh coming as the only indicated medicine now what to do with calica which potency how many doses who will tell you it's only our uh, thinking about the patient and medicine and we have so many criteria by which it's little difficult for a beginner to come to a conclusion 30 is the potency 20 is the potency. so we follow a very very common uh, Thing, when you are in confusion start with the 30 but it's not a science osology has to be improved in scientific way one must study what happens 
Now, this is what I am thinking. What happens when indicated medicine is administered on the basis of totality? Most of the people know it cures. But we have to study this. Also, we have to study if a medicine is given which is partially indicated, then what happens? And third, if a medicine is administered which is not at all indicated. So all kind of such studies has to be done and documented. Now, when I was reading one book, uh, Harvey Farrington's Materia Medica, I found this very nice piece of information, which I want to share uh, to all the participants. See what he writes, the extensive experience. I mean, uh, for, uh, Harvey Farrington writes about this. The extensive experience of Dr. August Beer of Berlin University proved three cardinal requisites of homeopathic prescription, which we know. The single remedy, which is given alone, which is very, very rare, I will tell you. There are few classical homeopaths who can claim that they prescribe single remedy. <clears throat> but most of the colleges also, most of the prescribers also, I am telling most, not all. They give several remedies. And nowadays, uh, as somebody has questioned also, there are different combinations found in the market. Headache, one name of medicine is headache, number something. And people are giving that. So is it homeopathy? Then how to make a study of pharmacovigilance? We are at law. So he, his uh, marks were single remedy, then one it will act. Then similar remedy. It has to be based on totality and similar similar. Minimum dose. So these three requisites, which is must for homeopathy, if you follow and prescribe a medicine, then what happens? He has given his own study. He explains the above by saying that all the cells of body are not sick. See, it's a beautiful thing which you can remember. When we prescribe a medicine based on, suppose, lycopodium, then all the totality is lycopodium. If you give lyco, all the cells which are similar or the person is similar will be stimulated. But there are many uh, like partially indicated, no indicated. If that medicine comes, what happens? The finally subdivided remedy goes past the healthy cells because they have no attraction for it. So sick cells will receive based on similarity and healthy cells will not receive because they have no attraction, there is no similarity because similarity is the basis of all actions. So that medicine will not act, just passed. The sick cells have less resistance and are more responsive to stimuli. The minimum dose affect these hypersensitive sick cells and stimulate them to reaction. And then how the cure happens. So as per him, if the medicine is not indicated, it won't do anything. It will just pass through. But remember what he's telling. If it is a single medicine, if it is given in minimum dose, but if it is given in uh, several material doses, then it will have different action. And regarding this, we have to understand the aggravations because this is also a concept in general public also that when homeopathic medicine is given, it will increase, it will bring out all the problems from the root and then patient will be cured. You know, some of the patients are so afraid to come and ask with their skin problem, with other problems, doctor, uh, can we give a medicine which will not take out from root because we are so tired of suffering if not, uh, we will uh, see later homeopathic medicine. So all those things we have to see. What type of aggravation then only? Okay. 
So um, our stalwarts have defined aggravations in few categories, homeopathic aggravations. Homeopathic aggravation means the symptoms becomes a little more, but patient feels better. This is another very uh, controversial thing. One of uh, my students was asking, if symptoms are aggravated, how a patient can feel better? True. So that aggravation is different. He is not the disease symptoms aggravated. It's a, a few uh, feeling are increased. Like feeling of burning, maybe heightened for little time. Then it becomes all right. But as a whole, person is feeling better. There's two things that has to be there in homeopathic aggravation. Generally, what happens in our practice, a patient comes with a skin problem. And he's already using some steroid medicines, applications also, internal also. When you take the case and give a medicine which is indicated, and patient goes home and takes, what he does is, he stops all the medicine suddenly, which has been taking since years together. Like this, even allergy problem. A person who is taking two years citrusin, and then he comes to you and you give a medicine and he stops citrusin. And next day morning, he starts sneezing. He says, since I started homeopathy medicine, the sneezing has become too much. No. And that fellow skin problem, he says, since I started your medicine, the itching has become too much. No. It's because you have been taking a medicine for years together and you have stopped suddenly without asking me. So all those factors have to be taken together to see the aggravations. So if it is homeopathic aggravation, well and good. Disease aggravation means your medicine is not correct. And this is just going on and it has not taken care of anything of your medicine. Here, the medicinal aggravations comes, which is very rare in homeopathy, I will tell you. Unless the medicine is given too many times, uh, the doses which is unnecessary, or uh, the potency which is not right, you know, something is wrong with your prescription, and it's not one time wrong, and not once wrong, it has been wrong since long time. So all this we have to analyze. And if there is a medicinal aggravation, that comes in our pharmacology. That a medicine can do so many hazards if it is given to a person repeatedly. That will be the study. In this regard, uh, Kent's observation is that there are 12 observations I'm going to highlight much. But Kent was only one person who studied what happens what a medicine can do after it is administered. And after 12 observations, there has been no further study. Even on this 12 observation, <clears throat> we have to make some scientific uh, kind of documented. First observation, we all remember. Second, we all remember. But we have to apply in our practice and create some documents in favor of this so that it becomes a scientific observation. And here all medicinal regulations has to be reported to pharmacology. In this, uh, including my experience, I would like to highlight a few experiences which uh, is from the literature. Kent's experience. You know, uh, Kent has said, just remember, uh, I mean, I am emphasizing on the words which he has said. He has said that we are very fortunate that we are not able to prescribe constitutional medicine in every case because we are not studying very depth in the patient. Why is telling? We are very fortunate not to prescribe. The next sentence is telling because the way we repeat medicines will create hazards. 
And one of his experience, you may be knowing Clara Louise Kent was his second wife. She came for the treatment first as a patient to him. And then when Kent was taking the case, he found Clara Louise Kent, I mean, that time she was not Kent, Clara Louise, narrated all the symptoms of lachesis as if you are reading a textbook. Kent was very surprised. How a person can take ditto one to one all the symptoms? Then he asked, are you taking homeopathy medicine? She said, yes. Since when? Since two years. And what are the medicines he showed the president? Black acids. He said, you have proved this medicine. And see, this can be taken as one of the pharmacovigilance if a similar medicine a constitutional medicine, which is 100% matching with the person's constitution and medicine symptomatology. If that is repeated many times, it creates all the symptoms, uh, you can say artificial sickness. So that is one case which Kent has narrated. I was reading ML Tyler's Lacrosis. Very peculiar thing, you know, Lacus is written, and I advise all of you must read Lacus. <laughs> She's telling, you know, one lady was sitting in OPD and talking so much, so much, so much. When she came inside, she was given Lacus. Next follow, when she came, she was just quiet sitting. I'm just telling this is, doesn't come under pharmacovigilance. Uh, but she narrates further one case in that same drug picture of lacrosis. She tells that one person was taking lacrosis 30 for a chronic cataract. And then physician was happy that she's improving. Physician gave lacrosis 200. And then she started one symptom that some kind of urging without anything coming out. And this troubled her like anything. Each time she's sitting, she feels that. She has to go. And when she goes, nothing comes out. She was so much troubled, so much troubled that she came to the doctor that, no, uh, earlier I was better. You, what you have done to me? Then the person has prescribed, I mean the market tiger. CPA, just to antidote. And then all symptoms became all right. Now, further, if you read, she is telling. When I referred Kent's repertory, that there is a rubric, constant urging without any outcome. Lachesis, three marks, only one remedy. So that means, yes, it has been produced by the man. So, and then later, she was given like this 1M without any harm. Then one conclusion she is deriving that like this 200 is a wicked potency. And she gives an example of a German physician who also had several cases which had a lot of problem with like this 200, but 30 and 1M was better for them. And that same German physician he also has experience with lycopodium and he is telling lycopodium you should give 30 starting and then skip 200 and give one. I cannot explain this, the scientific reason, but experience of so many German physicians and Margaret Tyler has defined lachesis 200 as a wicked potency. You give it and see if it is working well, if it is not working, please avoid. So such kind of things has to be uh, brought into uh, under uh, pharmacovigilance. Even as, even as you must have read glonine. And then at one instance, he gave glonine one next to a person for something else. He came with severe dreaded headache with very red eyes, red face and severe headache. He antidoted. Then, 
one of his friend was challenging him that homeopathy medicine does not work what proof you have you give any medicines i will take nash said take this medicine and he gave glonion 1x and next within 5 minutes he started very severe headache so such kind of medicine unless they are similar should be avoided and should be brought to notice of all the practitioners some of our experience uh, like you know one patient said i am totally all right doctor uh that patient was having headache it was naturally prescribed totally all right i said he said okay then continue for another one month because i used to give you know uh one dose followed by placebo for a month and then come back or sometimes uh once a week one dose so i repeated the prescription next time when he came he said your first prescription was good doctor second time i had so severe headache see what happened we have done unnecessary medication so such kind of things we have to learn from experience and inform others make documents and then share with others so that same kind of mistakes like adverse drug even should not happen so dear friend you also may be having some of the experiences which we have to not only keep with us but share it now i easily share with my students don't do such things because it may aggravate it may cause problems some of the skin problems we have found repetition is a problem repetition does harm so we have rules in homeopathy for repetition please follow that but if something happens even if you follow the repetition law then it must be a case of idiosyncrasy and in that person that medicine should not be given should not be generalized now some uh, instruction which i found uh, very useful in boric and which is a kind of warning i have collected which i want to share and please follow this in practice also what he writes in enkim tart is the lower potency sometimes aggravate and enkim tart stick should not be given in children even i have noticed i start enkim tart mostly at 200 it is indicated then he writes argentum metallicum not too frequent repetition now actually we don't understand too frequent repetition but you can say cautious repetition you have given one dose observe the action needed repeat not needed continue continue placebo or other medications i mean non medicated things till comes to a standstill bacillinum what uh, he is writing the dose is important see here he writes the dose is important this is important everywhere in your uh, should not be given below 30 and not repeated frequently calcarea cabi writes should not should not be repeated too frequently in elderly people and at one place can be written calcarea cab can be repeated in children many times to see here age wise also difference is there but we do not know why i mean scientific explanation we to find out should not be repeated too frequently calcarea floor also it is written diphtherinum he writes must not repeat too frequently justicia adatota yes this i want to tell you because many people prescribe justicia adatota for beginning of cold and they prescribe in tincture what he writes is severe aggravation have been noticed from lower potencies so be careful while prescribing justice or other than kali kabhi right don't repeat too often use cautiously in old gouty cases advanced brights and tuberculosis it can cause flare up of those uh, symptoms lacasis right does ought not be repeated too frequently 
Medorinum must not be repeated often. Same thing he writes, must not be repeated often in Sorinum also. Pyrogenum. Now see, pyrogenum, what we do mostly? In a fever case, we keep repeating. So this is another uh, thing we have to understand. See, lacasis also we just read. Does not ought be repeated too frequently. But if you refer Margaret's drug picture, in a case of throat, she has given lacasis 200. Though she was uh, writing about 200. Six doses in 24 hours. And after 24 hours, the throat became clear. Patient is free from temperature. The same thing is written in the second page of one of the paragraphs, which you must go through. So in acute case, what I was telling you, legacy should not be given or something should not be given too often is when, when it's a constitutional medicine. But when it is acute medicine and it's a partial similarity, it can be repeated without much harm. But same repetition, if you do in constitutional, it does harm. And these things has to be documented. Then he writes, Centronanium. Do not give a child with fever or constipation. CPR should not be used too low or be repeated too frequent. Veritamal in diarrhea, not to below 6 potent. So these are some of the experiences uh, which all must be having, but we have to share it. Now the conclusion comes. I was given only half an hour. So I hope uh, I'm doing justice to the topic. What conclusion, uh, what I am coming to that is, a homeopathic physician must prescribe as per homeopathic principle and should document the changes after administering doses, favorable, adverse, or no action. And then try to find out and study the case. Institutions must volunteer such work and publish it. See, this is not possible for an individual, and especially when it's a busy practice now, to do such kind of analytical study. So that is why I was telling, this is the work of clinician, but it has to be guided by academics. And the remaining work should be done by clean, I mean, by clinician and accommodation both to make our system scientific. So institution must volunteer. They should preferably uh, make few cases study wise. Such documentation should be shared with the general public so that finally, you know. Uh, who are the people who face uh, patients and who are the people who face good or bad reaction? Tanks are fighting is a clinician. So we have to make them aware of such things that in homeopathy also such things exist and be careful while practicing and while dealing with the patient. Thank you all very much. Sorry for not uh, putting you on the full screen because I'm not very technically as expert, but I could deliver whatever I was thinking to the uh, That was okay, sir. But the uh, information that you had given was actually uh, mind blowing, sir, really. <laughs> so, sir, as uh, uh, given us, uh, even though we used to feel that uh, homeopathic medicines are very safe, uh, now, uh, sir, has given from the different literatures as well as from his own experience how cautious we need to be while prescribing homeopathic medicines. So, uh, and sir, has also mentioned that uh, whatever experience you are getting by the different prescription, it needs to be very carefully documented. And that is what is the aim of the pharmacovigilance program that has started. 
because it is from the documentation of the different uh, pioneers that uh, uh, the remedy relations and such cautions are appearing in the different uh, literatures or the different metrimedica that is available. So, uh, but uh, we can observe that after uh, some period of time, such documentations are not there. So what Sarah has mentioned is, even we need to uh, have an attitude to document uh, such aggravations or uh, such cautions, what needs to be followed with respect to each medicine or each disease. Right now, sir? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, from our uh, audience, I mean, from our delegates, there are a few queries. Sir, what about prescribing justicia tincture for cough? See, uh, justicia tinctures, many people are prescribing. <clears throat> Even in man, many of the combinations where you say so called cough therapy, homeopathy, justicia is given. But justicia tinctures uh, do damage also. Uh, I have seen, because one patient was in a hurry, so justicia fired up three times, I guess. His cold became all right, but his throat became very bad. So I don't prescribe this system. Also. We have a lot of good medicines which are well proved. Aconite, Pulsinia, Lemnamide, Gracie, they are well prescribed. As a system also you can give, but follow the caution, you know, go for 30. Better, that is a homeopathy medicine. Tincture is not a homeopathy medicine. It may be palliative, but some palliations are also bad. If they produce something else and uh, palliate one thing. So be cautious. Uh, what I have seen is it causes bad throat and improves that nose discharge. That's all it can do. So that instruction which Borik has given just if your lower protein should not be prescribed is almost uh, uh, you can say tally with my my experience. Sir, another question is: Does six cells accept dissimilar remedies? Uh, no, it, it just passes through as per his system. But if it is repeatedly given in material doses, it will make any, any cell sick. Sir, how to differentiate homeopathic aggravation from ADR? How to differentiate homeopathic aggravation from ADR? See, homeopathic aggravation is well defined. Here, uh, as I was telling, some of the symptoms may be just heightened with overall well feeling of the person. Whereas, in any kind of adverse reaction, overall patient will feel bad. And symptoms, no doubt, will feel aggravated. Or even if symptoms are one or two less and one or two more, if as a whole person is feeling bad, then it comes in area. But homeopathic aggravation, here the whole patient is feeling better. So no question of area. Thank you so much, sir, for your sharing experience as you have emphasized upon the word sharing with our colleagues, with our teachers. So definitely you have shared with us your experience and your knowledge. And we are so grateful for your contribution to the system of homeopathy. Thank you so much, sir. I must thank all the participants and the organizers uh, that I could share my experience. The only thing is I, I was not very well versed with the technical arrangements of the computers, so I could not show the full slide. But uh, I hope uh, we'll keep learning even from the mistakes. And I hope that whatever we have presented We'll make some effort towards pharmacovigilance to make homeopathic science as a science. Yes, sir. Very truly, sir. <clears throat> Thank you so much, sir. Okay, we have with us our third resource person, that is Dr. Vivek Saktidharan. Dr. Vivek Saktidharan has completed his BHMS and MD in homeopathy from Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital. Sir is presently working as an associate professor in the Department of Homeopathic Pharmacy, 
Father Muller, Homeopathic Medical College. Sir is a member of a panel of assessors, the Kerala State Council for Clinical Establishments, member of Father Muller Institutional Scientific Committee and Institutional Ethics Committee. Sir has presented research papers in various national and international conferences. His latest national conference was at the Northeast National Homeopathic Conference and Scientific Seminar by IHMA, hosted in Shillong. And his international conference was at the International Homeopathic Conference in Dubai, organized by UAE Chapter of Indian Homeopathic Medical Association. He also has to his credit a number of various publications. Today, Sir will enlighten us with his presentation on the topic, causality analysis, assessment and reporting with homeopathic perspective. Over to you, Sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mavan. Uh, good evening, everyone. My topic for today is causality assessment. We'll go to the slides. So once again, good evening, everyone. My topic for today is causality assessment and reporting of adverse drug reactions. So uh, as has been said by Dr. Uh, Paul as well as Tiwari sir, uh, is, it is also mentioned by our uh, great Swiss physician Paracelsus around 200 years ago. Poison is in everything and no thing is without poison. The dosage is what makes it a poison or a remedy. So we have a common uh, misconception that all drugs of natural origin are safe. And now from the uh, presentations of uh, Tiwari sir, it is clear that even though uh, our homeopathic medicines are of natural origin, there is a lot of caution that we need to follow uh, to make our prescription a safer one. So for that purpose, uh, the concept of pharmacovigilance has started which is a science of collecting, monitoring, researching, and assessing and evaluating the information uh, from healthcare providers and patients on the adverse effects of medications. Okay, and uh, the recently the Ayush Ministry has started the concept of pharmacovigilance uh, for homeopathic as well as well as Ayurvedic and Ayush systems of medicines. And the objectives of this. Uh, uh, this uh, pharmacovigilance program in Ayush is to inculcate a reporting culture among the consumers as well as uh, Ayush practitioners to facilitate the documentation of ADRs. As uh, Tiwari sir was telling, we, uh, and the older pioneers have observed a lot of caution and that needs to be followed uh, for the prescription of our medicines, but that is not being followed with the uh, practitioners at present. So the objective of this pharmacovigilance program is to uh, inculcate a reporting culture. It is, it is to inculcate a observing culture in, in, with respect to the uh, different practitioners and to report it to the uh, pharmacovigilance program so that it is not to sue anyone, but it is for the formulation of a, a system-wise uh, system database, system-wise database uh, which can be referred by any doctor who is prescribing a particular medicine in the future. So the, that is the second one, that is to develop a system-wise database of ADRs of ASU and H drugs and evolving evidence-based recommendations regarding clinical safety. So another uh, aim of this uh, pharmacovigilance program is to report the instances of misleading advertisement. So regarding that, our Dr. Gino will be speaking in the next session. So my topic for today is mainly the causality assessment. So we said that uh, when we are observing an, uh, observing a aggravation in any patient, first thing what we need to do is we need to do a causality assessment. So what is this causality assessment? By doing a causality assessment, we are actually uh, making sure that whatever aggravation we have observed is linked to that of the medicine. So the causality assessment is a method used to estimate the strength of relationship between drug exposure and occurrence of the adverse reaction. 
so by doing this we are make uh, we are assessing or we are checking whether that particular aggravation that has caused or that particular symptoms what has evolved whether it is due to that particular medication what you what we have given or whether it is due to that particular dosage what we have given or is it due to any other factors so why should you do this uh, causality assessment okay so the adrs are a you can see that the adrs are a significant cause of morbidity hospital admissions and even death in uh, the present scenario so the causality assessment evaluates the likelihood that a particular treatment is a cause for the observed event so if you are able to monitor or uh, do the causality assessment and link a particular uh, symptom etiology or morbidity morbidity with a particular uh, kind of medicine or the medication we will be able to deliver better healthcare okay so it is uh, there are a lot of factors that could be contributing to the um, uh, adrs that could be observed nowadays Uh, substandard medicines that could be available uh, nowadays because we are not sure of whatever uh, crudes that are available for the manufacturers nowadays because nowadays you can see that most of the manufacturers or the drug dealers are uh, going in for the profit so we are not sure of whatever is the quality of the crude that is available for uh, each uh, that is available for each manufacturer or we are not sure of whatever is the quality of the drug that is being produced or we are not sure uh, of what are the effect of the combined uh, medicines that are being launched in a combination medicine so due to many of these factors we need to do such uh, causality assessment studies and assessment of the adrs so that we can deliver a safer healthcare so this is already uh, discussed the classification of adr so i will not go into that so we'll see what are the steps that are involved in a adr diagnosis so how can we diagnose an adr so first thing what is important is a history what are the uh, history of the patient regarding his illness as well as uh, whatever has he has gone through that is very important uh, one um example sir uh, tiwari sir had very, very well mentioned that is uh, one patient who was suddenly discontinued uh, her, his ongoing treatment when a new treatment has started so is it because of that the new symptom that has come up and we also need to uh, do proper physical examination and investigation to assess what are the changes that has happened in that particular uh, patient after that particular medicine was given and also we need to have a, a very clear time relationship the time relationship after the uh, administration of the medicine as well as the uh, occurrence of the symptom is very important so that is what we call as a temporal relationship so time of onset versus the uh, time of drug administration so how much time has elapsed after the particular medicine was administered and the new symptom has come up so that relationship we need to very clearly maintain and the nature of reaction during this correlation whether the symptom has come up immediately or whether it has come up after a particular period of time and we also need to evaluate what are the clinical or pathological features that has come up uh, during that event okay existing information we also need to know the existing information about that particular drug and the same class of drugs so the, whether this similar drugs are having such kind of action also we need to evaluate and uh, this is another very important thing concomitant medications so whether the patient is on any other medication along with that um, uh, along with the medicine that we are given which the patient has not revealed so uh, once the uh, once the patient has come up with an adr so this needs to be very clearly assessed and whether there are any underlying or concurrent 
illnesses whether he is having any other illnesses which he has not mentioned uh, while taking the medicine from us or whether some of the uh, uh, patients might be having uh, a very long standing disease which they might have uh, forgotten while uh, taking disease from i mean taking medicine from us so such details needs to be uh, um, assessed and next uh, important thing is d challenge or dose reduction so when a patient is coming to you with an adr first thing what you can try is a d challenge stop the medication or stop the dosage of the medication that is going on so when you stop the medication or when you reduce the dose if the symptom that has come up or if the adr is reducing you can uh, as, uh, you can uh, assess that or you can think that that particular symptom has come up due to that particular medication in some cases you can even rechallenge so once the dosage is stopped in d challenge you can if you are finding that the symptoms are reducing you can once more try rechallenging the medicine you can once more try increasing the dose of that medicine uh, it may not be possible in every case if the symptom what has come up is you know for very severe uh, form this rechallenge may not be possible so in rechallenge if it is a very milder form of uh, symptom that has come up you can try a rechallenge or you can again try introducing that particular dose or you can try uh, reintroducing the uh, medicine and see whether the symptoms are coming up again again uh, once more we'll repeat the patient's characteristics and the past medical history is very important and also the possibility of drug interactions so uh, we need to take the history of whatever med uh, medications that the patient has uh, undergone in the past or whether the patient has uh, is already on any other homeopathic medication from a, any other uh, physician before coming to you or a, whether he is on any other medication of any other system before coming to you all such inter, uh, details needs to be uh, recorded so there could be chance of possible drug interaction between uh, our medicines as well as the medicines from other systems of uh, other system or other, other medical systems so these things these evidence are very important when you are assessing uh, the uh, causality of the uh, symptom that has come up so only by getting these particular evidences only then we will be able to link whether the particular uh, adr that has come up is due to that particular medicine that you are given or is it uh, whether it is due to some other uh, confounding factors and there are different methods to assess this causality so how can you assess the causality so one of the uh, very common method is from by expert opinion so you can uh, contact any expert that is who is uh, expert in that particular field uh, and get his opinion regarding the uh, adverse reaction or symptomatology that has come up at that moment so that will be based on that expert's knowledge and experience but the disadvantage of this system is that it fails to achieve reproducibility and validation and it also lacks transparency the uh, expert opinion will be also based on the uh, uh, expert uh, opinion of that particular expert which could be subjected to bias or misinterpretation so even though this is a very easier method it has a lot of disadvantages so little more uh, scientific method could be the use of different algorithms so algorithms are the use of different questions or the use of different questionnaires which with or without scoring so this is more transparent and consistent and it can it, it will be more reproducible but the uh, disadvantage is that the reduced ability to apply clinical judgment so the judgment of a expert will not be applicable in case of a algorithm because when you are applying an algorithm we will have to stick on to the algorithm or the questions that are given in that particular questionnaire 
so the clinical judgment of an expert will not come into play when you are uh, applying an algorithm so another method is the bayesian approach so the bayesian approach aims at uh, linking the predicting the outcome of the event based on previous information so we'll be referring the different literatures the uh, different literature that is available with respect to that particular medicine or to, with respect to that particular group of medicines or uh, with that particular group of diseases and based on that previous literature that is available we'll be trying to link the adverse event that has happened with the with respect to the patient and one of the very commonly used algorithm is the naranjo's probability scale and the naranjo's criteria uh, it is uh, modified for homeopathy it is called as monarch it is modified naranjo criteria for homeopathy so if with respect to modified naranjo criteria for homeopathy we will be uh, answering a number of questions so a patient will be coming to you and saying that uh, my symptoms are aggravated or i got a new group of symptoms so we'll be taking this algorithm this uh, monarch uh, scale and we'll be asking these number of questions to the patient and we'll be doing the scoring so we'll be asking the questions like was there an improvement in the main symptom or condition for which the homeopathic medicine was prescribed so based on whether the patient says yes or no we'll be doing a scoring uh, the question like the, did the clinical improvement occur within a plausible time frame was there was there an initial aggravation of symptom so with respect to the homeopathic concepts there are a number of uh, uh, questions that are being formulated and the uh, based on yes or no or not sure we'll be doing a scoring so with respect to that there is a, a, a total of 13 scores that uh, the score total is 13 and if you are getting a score of more than 9 you can be sure that whatever symptom has appeared is a strong evidence for an adr so if you are getting a score of more than 9 you can be sure that that particular drug has produced that particular uh, adr and uh, there will be a plausible time relationship so there will be a very strong time frame relation with the drug administration and the appearance of the symptom and uh, uh, there may not be uh, any relation with uh, between the symptom or the disease condition of that patient and the appearance of the new symptoms so one more thing what you can observe is that the uh, symptoms will disappear on d challenge and it will reappear on uh, rechallenge so if such things are observed we can be sure that that particular uh, adr is caused due to that particular uh, medicine another uh, uh, section is if the scoring is between 5 to 8 it is called as probable or likely uh, it can be due to that medicine but we are not sure so such things uh, appear when the rechallenge information is not available so there can be a time relation or the symptoms may reduce on uh, uh, d challenge but the re challenge information the re administration of the drug information may not be available so that is called as probably probable or likely and if the score is between 1 to 4 uh, it may not be may or may not be due to that particular medicine so symptom may continue even after the drug is stopped so it may not be due to the uh, uh, medicine that the symptom has come up but it could be due to some other confounding factors uh, what the patient has undergone so to get a clear picture of that we need to take the complete history of the patient as well as what are the uh, disease conditions he had or what are the medicines he has taken during that treatment period all those history needs to be uh, taken and if the score is zero the reaction is likely related to some other factor which is other than that of the drug so for the uh, for this purpose a very clear cut uh, history taking should be done to relate that uh, the uh, adr or the symptom that has come up 
with that of the medicine so again uh, what to observe or report so any aggravations or sub suspected drug related adverse events including those suspected to have been caused by interaction with any other drugs or food so as i said the uh, uh, increase in the symptom or this new symptom that has come up may not be directly due to the particular drug what is given so it can be due to the dosage or it can be due to any other uh, confounding factors or uh, like the different uh, uh, food that has been taken during uh, that period of time so the uh, it can be due to the different the food incompatibilities or it can be a uh, incompatible uh, drugs that has been taken during that period of time so whatever it is it can uh, it needs to be observed and it needs to be reported so who can report any healthcare prof professional can report the adr that is being observed in a uh, practice so only if you uh, do such observation and only if you do such um, causality assessments we will be able to uh, bring up our uh, bring up a new database where we can uh, uh, get a clear cut picture of the new drug relationships that can uh, come up with respect to each and every medicine with respect to the new uh, change in lifestyle or uh, the new uh, environment factors that could be acting on a uh, uh, patient so again this is already mentioned by sopen sir where should i report so it can be uh, reported to any of the nearby uh, peripheral pharmacovigilance center or we have the uh, ayush suraksha website through which the reporting can be done or it can also be reported through the um, a telephone number of the ayush suraksha and what happens to the submitted reports is it is not to punish any uh, doctor that is reporting that uh, adrs so uh, we will be will uh, in need not have that fear that if i report will i be in jail no so this the aim of such reporting is not to uh, blame anyone but it is just to prepare a, a central database so that every uh, physician in the future uh, can uh, refer what are the caution that i need to follow before prescribing this particular medication so that we can evolve an evidence based recommendation regarding clinical safety so thank you thank you so much dr vivek for your presentation i'm sure we all have been mesmerized by his um, contribution and by what uh, vivek sir has shown no other person i believe can show such uh, homeopathic scientificity explain in a more detail and more pertinent way so we are grateful and we are thankful uh, to you dr vivek uh, there is a question sir homeopathic aggravation can be an ethical issue whether homeopathic aggravation can be an uh, so uh, uh, it is actually not an ethical issue because uh, the reason is we are we are not doing anything to harm the patient so it has mm -hmm. happened uh, unknowingly to the patient uh, we mm -hmm. have whatever we have done for the patient will be for the good of the patient but the aggravation might have happened uh, due to some other confounding factors as i said it can be due to the some some other uh, drugs that the patient uh, might be taking or due to some other uh, foods that the patient might have taken or it could be also due to some other um, uh, some other uh, environmental conditions the patient might have undergone during that period a treatment period so it is uh, it is not an ethical issue uh, it uh, that's the re that's what i told if you report the adr uh, a physician will not be sued because you have not done anything to harm the patient uh, whatever you have done will be for the good of the patient but uh, uh, you might be creating a new observation with respect 
you might be creating sorry okay so uh, by doing such an observation you might be creating a new uh, observation or new documentation with respect to the caution that me, you, uh, every doctor needs to follow while doing any prescription uh, so as i said uh, uh, the tiwari sir also mentioned the same thing during uh, uh, the older pioneers when we were, when they were doing different provings or when they were uh, during their practice they were observing what are the caution that needs to be followed while prescribing that particular medicine sir had already mentioned a number of examples uh, uh, the uh, the examples like the uh, that of in case of lachesis 200 sir said that there was an observation that lachesis 200 is a weaker potency than lachesis 30 or 1m so then the example where uh, uh, argentan nitricum basilinum calcarea carb calcarea flor it should not be frequently repeated so those are the clinical observations of different stalwarts but uh, with respect to the newer medicines that are coming up there are no such remedy relationship uh, that are uh, mentioned in any of the literatures and from our side the present practitioners we are not contributing anything to the uh, general metro medica so uh, such observations whatever we do if you are able to uh, contribute to the pharmacovigilant system your contribution also might come up in the general database okay i hope uh, it is clear okay uh, thank you everyone thank you so much dr vivek for your presentation and for your sharing now we have the last resource person of today uh, dr jinu jos dr jinu jos has pursued his bhms from alvas homeopathic medical college and hospital mangaluru and completed his md in homeopathic pharmacy from farmola homeopathic medical college and hospital sir is currently working as assistant professor in department of homeopathic pharmacy in farmola homeopathic medical college and hospital sir is also a member of a panel of assessors as a kerala state council for clinical establishments sir has presented papers in various international and national conferences and has guided students for different research project today in our midst sir will be speaking on the topic drug and magic remedies objectionable advertisements act 1954 and its importance to pharmacovigilance over to you sir thank you dr meban so here i will start with my presentation with a picture of two products this which are recently launched in market so these products are launched during corona time uh, while seeing this advertisement what is coming to your mind one is coronal tablet other one is immunopred so advertisements are playing a important role in our daily life people were engaged in false advertisements of various drugs and medical remedies were also advertised without any fear if there is any uh, there is no rule means so for converting such type of false advertisement central government has taken certain actions as a result of that drug uh, as a result of that action uh, government came to that drug and magic remedy act in 1954 so this is a third objective of pharmacovigilance in this act they have listed out almost 54 medical conditions so the objective of this uh, drug and magic remedy act an act to control the advertisement of drugs in certain cases 
advertisements and media are playing a significant uh, role in our daily life so th the drug in industries to promote their growth in their industries are often prone to promoting misleading advertisements of drugs which is not only legal to do but also cost of the life of the human being who buy the consume the drugs to avoid such mis misfortunes the central government has brought forward an enhancement in year 1957 50 sorry 54 called the drug and magic remedy act so the main objective is to prohibit the advertisement for certain purpose of remedies only to possess magic qualities and to provide for matter con connect there with so these are some uh, advertisements if you see these advertisements that are claiming that so many diseases will cure like headache neuralgia toothache etc which may not be possible practically and most of the conditions mentions are coming under the section 3 of uh, drug and magic remedy act that is uh, prohibition of advert adver advertisement of certain drugs for treatment of certain diseases and disorders due to these advertisements of drugs which is not only legal to do but also cost the uh, human life also you see the definition of uh, advertisement advertisement includes any notice circular label wrapper or other document and any announcement made orally or by any means of producing transmitting light smoke etc before the enhancement of this act there was no law to punish the unprincipled people who were engaged in false advertisement and claimed miraculous health particularly health which is seen in the uh, previous slide the people were engaged in false advertising advertisements of various drugs and medical remedies were also advert advertised without any fear so the government <coughs> enacted strict rule to prevent the self medication by the consumers regarding various diseases and condition so drug drug means a medicine for the internal or external use of human being or animal or any substance intended to be used for or in the diagnosis cure treatment or prevention of disease in human beings or animal if you see from homeopathic view homeopathy medicine means medicine uh, which is included uh, in a drug which is recorded in homeopathy provings and recorded in authentic homeopathy literatures of india so any article other than food intended to affect the influence in any way the structure or organic functions of the body of human beings or animal magic remedy it includes talisman mantra kavaja and any other charm of any kind which is allied to possess miraculous power it may be any object typically ring or stone that is thought to have magic power and good luck that also will be will be included as uh, magic remedy act so taking any part in the publication of an any advertisement means printing printing of the advertisement so this act extend all over india except the state jammu and kashmir and it applies also the person live in the territories uh, to which this act extends so the publication of any advertisement outside the territories to which this act extend by or at the instance of a person residing within the said territories section 3 prohibition of advertisement of certain drugs of treatment of certain diseases and disorders uh either administration of any substance with the intention to produce the miscarriage in women or prevention of conception in women or the maintenance or improvement of the cap capacity of human beings for sexual pleasure or correction of menstrual disorder in women or the diagnosis or cure treatment or prevention of any disease or diseases disorder or conditions 
specified in the schedule or any other disease disorder or conditions also included in section 3 so some diseases are scheduled in section 3 that is uh, uh, totally around 54 diseases are scheduled that is appendicitis blindness uh, cancer cataract deafness diabetes and uh, uh, dropsy epilepsy uh, fever uh, insanity leprosy lockjaw uh, plague pleurity pneumonia tumor etc so these are the conditions are listed out to prohibit advertisement of certain disease and disorder so uh, above mentioned condition advertisement should not be done so this is the list which is mentioned in the schedule 3 before the enhancement of this act there was no law to punish the unprincipled people who were uh, engaged in false ad advertisements people were engaged in false advertisements of various drugs and medical medical remedies were also advised without any fear so next is uh, miss uh, section 4 that is prohibition of misleading advertisements relating to drugs that may be directly or indirectly give a false impression regarding the true character of a drug by seeing the advertisement the people who believes in such advertisement and they may act accordingly make a false claim of the drug or otherwise false misleading in any material particular these things are uh, prohibited of misleading advertisements of the drugs prohibition of advertisement of magic remedies for treatment of certain diseases and disorder no patient carrying on the profession of administering magic remedies shall take any part in the publication of any advertisement referring to any magic remedy which directly or indirectly claim to be efficacious for any of the purpose specified in section d that is prohibition of advertisement of certain drugs for the treatment of certain diseases and disorder or uh, that may be the diagnosis cure treatment or prevention of any disease condition specified in schedule now we see the which are the classes exempted for uh, advertisements is the advertisements which are relating to the drugs printed or pu or published by the government so we all are aware about the uh, that during corona time ayush government announced uh, about arsenica malum as a preventive medicine the second one an advertisement relating to a drug which is sent confidently in the prescribed manner to registered medical practitioner an advertisement uh, maybe uh, sometimes pharmaceutical companies they may send uh, some advertisement to the uh, practitioners that all things are exempted from this the next uh, displayed sign boards for, for notices by the registered medical practitioner for his premise so this also excluded from the drug and magic remedy act next is advertisement relating to the drug which complies with the required conditions as follows either leaflet or advertisement of drug in medical pharmaceutical scientific and technical journals therapeutic index or price list published by the licensed manufacturing importer and distributor so these all things are excluded excluded from drug and magic remedy act any advertisement relating to a drug printed or published with the previous sanction of the government granted prior of the commencement of the drug and magic remedy act also excluded so uh, exemption from the application of act 
the best example is during corona our minister of health specified arsenic amalu was preventive so the central government uh, for the public interest may permit any advertisement for office of any specified drugs or class of drugs by notification in the official gazette so next we'll see the about a penalty whoever contravenes any of the provision of this act or rule may be punishable in case of first conviction with impermiss impermissible with which may extend 6 month or with fine or without fine in case of subsequent conviction uh, punishment will be extend 1 year or with fine or with with both so in case of offenses by the companies usually uh, this uh, manufacturing companies is to do more advertisement in the case, case of contravention of provision of this act by any company every person who at the time of commission of the offense was in charge and responsible for the conduct of the company business shall be guilty and liable for the punishment so in this case um, uh, any employee or however such a person is not liable for punishment if he provides that the offense was committed without his knowledge or uh, that he has taken all the precaution to prevent the commission of such offenses these people are ex- accepted so we'll give some uh, case studies so uh, some uh, health guides which is uh, published by covino healthcare they promoting uh, and distributing sunshade to cure from migraine and sunstroke socks for acidity and some pillows cover for spondylosis palm guards for parkinson disease eye shade for sinusitis and uh, t-shirts for uh, high or low blood pressure short plants for to cure gas as acidity etc so uh, this case was against this uh, uh, convenio healthcare for the sale and promotion of uh, their uh, health gadgets in violation of the drug and magic if this is a uh, truly a violation of uh, drug and magic remedy act when the regulator asked the company to produce scientific evidence to support the effect of infrared rays which they claimed uh, to be present in their product the company said it had never undertaken such studies by any recognized indian misleading advertisement and consumer institute subject uh, what then what happened in uh, uh, regulator prohibited the sale and promotion of those products see one more case study that is by the md of punnat pharmaceutical convicted a violation of magic remedy act he said the company through advertisement was claiming that the product We, uh, treat infertility in both men and women the product is formulated from side mostly known as indian herbal stimulant so this uh, case has happened in 2009 the company had given advertisement in the daily magazine violating the provision of the act uh, the company was advertising stating that the product cure infertility the uh, then the drug inspector argued that and the court that the advertisement was in the contradiction of provision of the section 3 of uh, drug and uh, magic remedy act uh, then uh, the drug inspector said product is very uh, good but the case was taken for giving publicity violating drug and magic remedy act the court has imposed a penalty of 50000 and also imposed jail sentence for 4 months for the proprietor then one more case study that is a self tried baba uh, action against a self tried baba who advertise offering magic treatment to the patients action against self uh, the what do you know the petition read that nirmal baba had been advertising in different electronic and printing media claiming to offer magic treatment while claiming 
himself to be the uh, representative of god the court banned all the advertisement by the baba saying that such publicity was contrary uh, to provide provision of drug and magic remedy act so if you see like uh, cases uh, we have to report to the peripheral pharmacovigilance so who can report so the prime objective of this uh, scheme pharmacovigilance is to develop the culture to document the adverse effect and undertake the safety monitoring of homeopathy drugs and surveillance of misleading advertisements appearing in the uh, printed and electronic media so not only healthcare professionals but anyone can report misleading advertisement observed in the any media then uh, uh, what to report pharma uh, vigilance encourages all type of suspected areas and misleading advertisement advice that reaction related with the use of uh, medicine medical device uh, contrast media etc can be reported even misleading advertisements of i drugs also can be reported uh and uh, reporting on the prescribed format can be submit to the nearby consent pharmacovigilance uh, center so this uh, can be done by all the healthcare workers or anyone uh, misleading advertisement or pharmacovigilance center suspected area reporting forms of healthcare prevention and consumed available in the nearest uh, pharmacovigilance center thank you thank you dr gino for brushing us up through the drug and magic remedies act and for giving us a uh, more insight of the rules and the regulations which uh, needs to be followed in our practice of homeopathy thank you so much sir now i request our principal dr esj prabhu kiran to deliver the conclusion remarks good evening good evening to you all uh, i must congratulate the team Uh, uh, led by Dr. Vivek Shakti Dharan for uh, organizing a very fruitful and uh, very informative session on the pharmacovigilance awareness. It was really an awareness creating session of uh, four resource persons. Uh, we have seen uh, the Dr. Swapan Pal has mentioned about the statutory protocols. in the pharmacovigilance the concept of it and we had a wonderful session from dr s k tiwari uh, on the practical uh, aspect and also homeopathic perspective of uh, pharmacovigilance I, i i i am sure that you will agree with me when i said this is something you will you would not have got anywhere else the input from dr s k tiwari about the homeopathic perspective of the pharmacovigilance then we had a very awakening session or awareness creating session from dr vivek shakti dharan and also a very interesting session from dr gino jos where he has in involved us in going through the various protocols particularly legal aspects i once again uh, congratulate dr vivek shakti dharan for his presentation very effective practical presentation and also for all his efforts i thank uh, all the participants for attending this webinar i hope it is useful and informative thank you and i seek your cooperation in our future activities as well thank you Thank you so much, sir. I now invite Dr. Fatima Saudat, Program Assistant of our Peripheral Pharmacovigilance Center, 
to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, Doctor. Good evening to all. Gratitude is the fairest blossom that springs from the soul. The true method of knowledge is experiment, William Blake. I would like to thank the Ministry of Ayush for the initiation pharmacovigilance scheme for the safer use of Ayush system and providing the funds. I thank our management administrator, Reverend Father Roshan Krasta, for providing the required infrastructures and the facilities. I would like to thank our principal, Dr. ESJ Prabhu Kiran, and our vice principal, Dr. Vilma Mira de Souza, for guiding the organizing team with meticulous planning. This program has been made possible by the great sharing readiness of the resource persons who wholeheartedly accepted our invitation. On behalf of management and the entire organizing team and the delegates, I express my heartfelt gratitude to the resource persons of the day, Dr. Swapan Paul, Dr. Shashikan Tiwari, Dr. Vivek Shakti Daran, and Dr. Zeno Jos. I thank principals, vice principals, interns, and PG coordinator of various colleges in encouraging the staff and students to join the session today. I thank all the people who have backed up this support in sharing information about this webinar. Most of all, I thank all the delegates of the today's webinar, which includes teaching faculty, medical officers, interns, PG and UG students from various medical colleges, private and government practitioners all over India. We have with us the program coordinator and program assistants from the various pharmacovigilance centers and research officers from the different institutions. We have also recognized the presence of representatives from various manufacturers and also, I would like to bring to the spotlight about the delegates being from different eye streams, which includes not only homeopathy, but from Ayurveda, Siddha, and Yunani. A big thank to each and everyone. This enthusiasm and spirit shown by the delegates is what pushes us further ahead. I'm certain that everyone is greatly benefited by this webinar in learning the concept of pharmacovigilance and how to apply in your practice. Thank you. A very good evening to all. Thank you, Doctor. Dear delegates, we have shared the link for feedback in the chat box. You will be receiving the participation e-certificates in your respective emails on successful submission of the feedback. Please make sure that you provide the correct email ID as any mistake would lead to failure of sending the certificates. We hope that you all have been benefited by this small short session of pharmacovigilance awareness program and that you will use this knowledge in your clinical and research practice for the judicious use of our system in improving our homeopathic practice and in our homeopathic based on the homeopathic principles. Thank you. Myself, Dr. Mehban Pintingan Rani, signing off. Have a great evening to one and all.